Alrighty, so let's, um, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 42. Don, I'll try to remember all my junk and take it with me wherever Don is. Oh, there you are. Okay, Donnie. All right, let's see. So the title of the message is what if, dot, 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 what if, dot, dot, dot. As I was reading through the chapter this week, um, man, just an interesting chapter. In, I forgot what chapter it was. When Joseph was 17 years old, living under the roof, if you will, of his parents with his 11 brothers, God had given him a dream. And the dream was that he, that um, it, the picture of the dream was that his, if you will, bale of hay stood upright and 12 bales of hay bowed down to that one. And so he told that dream to his brothers and his brothers understood the significance that one day they would bow down to him. And so they hated him already, and the dream made them hate him even more. But he had a second dream that day. And the second dream was that not only the stars, but the moon and the sun bowed down to him. And that was a picture of his parents in addition to his brothers bowing down to him. And so his brothers then proceeded to want to kill him. And instead of killing him, they ended up throwing him into a pit. Reuben suggested, let's not kill him. That, that wouldn't be just. So his desire, Reuben, his brother's desire was to be able to put him in this pit so that he can come back later and rescue him. But that's not what happened. The, brothers, the other brothers are sitting down eating. And when that takes place, they see a group of Ishmaelites going, slave traders, on their way to Egypt. And they pull him out and they sell them to those Ishmaelite uh, slave traders. And so Reuben comes back and he sees what's going on. He's like, oh my gosh, like what happened? And I don't know if they ever explained it to him or whatever, but eventually Reuben's going to get wind of that, that they ended up slaving him, uh, s selling him into slavery. And so as far as they're concerned, uh, he's either in Egypt or, or dead, long gone. But now 20 years have passed from that time. Two decades have passed. And as I was reading through the chapter this week, I was hit with pathos. It's the Greek word for emotion. And there's just a lot of emotion in this chapter. And so that's really one thing that stood out, me, stood out to me. We're going to close with, so the title of the message, What If, dot, dot, dot. And we'll see what that relates to. But I had another title, Some of the Lies We Believe. All of us believe lies. They're called strongholds. And they resurrect themselves in our minds. And we think we have it figured out. We think we understand. We think we know. But the truth of the matter is, if we knew everything, then we would be God. And we don't know everything. There's things that we just don't know. And then the other title I gave it, Emotions, Can You Trust Them? Da da da. So we get to look at emotions today and what place they have and, and all of that stuff within our lives. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 42. Um, the last couple chapters, just by way of introduction before we pray and get into 42, um, the Pharaoh had a dream. And the Pharaoh's dream was two years when Joseph was in the prison. The first year he was in the prison, he interpreted the dream of the butcher and the baker. And those two dreams came to pass. Three days, it, it showed, it was proved to be true that he could, through the Lord, the Lord through him would be able to interpret these dreams. And so last time we saw that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had a dream and the butcher remembers, oh yeah, there's this guy that interpreted my dream and the baker's dream and they both came true. And so now he's been serving in Egypt's court, if you will, for a good seven, eight years. And that's how we get the 20 years since this um, incident. Because the seven years of 
famine or, or good plenty have already transpired and now we're going to see the beginning of the seven years of famine so that's where we pick it up in the story uh, in the account the historical account of what has taken place father we thank you for your word and Lord, there's so much to learn. We can, we can take our lives, Lord, and we can, we can put ourselves right here into the pages of scriptures. And we can recognize, Lord, that you want to speak to us where we're at. High, low, up, down, whatever our emotional state is, Lord, you want to minister to us. You want to reveal things to us. You want to caution us. You want to equip us, Lord. And so I just pray that you would speak through your word. Thank you for this time as we get to learn from the pages of Scripture. Open up, Lord, the understanding as we lift this time up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So title, What If? Genesis chapter 42. Verse, 41 says, um, verse 1 says, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? So they're gawking, if you will. Gawking, the definition is to stare stupidly. They're staring stupidly at one another. And it may be because it says that Jacob saw grain in Egypt. It's amazing what the conscience does. We can bury things, but eventually, inevitably, they leak out. And so in this case, the fact that two decades have gone by since they sold Joseph, these brothers, into slavery, um, man, Egypt is mentioned and all of a sudden, ta-ta-ta, something's going on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Verse 2, and he, Jacob, said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us uh, there that we may live and not die. And so even though the... Um, Famine is in Egypt. It's felt all over the world. Canaan, the surrounding areas, if you will, are affected as well. And so this seems to be a worldwide famine where Jacob and his family are affected, his 11 sons that are with him. And now they're grown, married, have their own families, but somehow they're still under that patriarch. They're still under the, their father Jacob. Verse 3, so Joseph's 10 brothers, minus Benjamin, right, the... 12th born of uh, Jacob. So the 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Now 10 in the Bible is a representative of the law. And so the law is going to go try to buy bread. And we know that Jesus being the bread of life, bread of life is free. You can't buy it. It's, it's a free gift. And so, but they're going to, they're going to give their best go at it. And so it is with us. We try to work our way to heaven. We try to do the law. We try to jump through the hoops. And what ends up happening inevitably, eventually, is frustration. Because we can be good, but we can't be good enough to attain God's standard. Which is what? Perfection. God's standard is perfect righteousness, perfect holiness. And none of us meet up to that standard. So Jesus had to do that on our behalf. And that's an assault to the person, to the pride of man of humanity that wait, wait I'm not good enough you be good but you're, you're not good enough verse 4 but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers for he said lest some calamity befall him and the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan so Jacob is not going to send Benjamin and he says unless some calamity befall him now we're going to look at emotions and imagine his emotional state. Joseph was his favorite through his own words, right? By his own admonition. Joseph was his favorite and it tells us why in the Bible. Because he was the child of his later years. And so Joseph would be the 11th born. But his other brothers hated him and so they did this horrific thing. And they took his coat of many colors, or coat with big sleeves. However, it could be interpreted both ways. But they took this special jacket covering that he had, and they took goat's blood, and they dipped it in the goat's blood, and they brought it to their father and said, uh, look what we found. I mean, do you recognize it? He said, that's Joseph's coat. And, and his father, their father says, Jacob says, man, a wild beast must have got him. And even in that anguish, even in that pain, 
even in that horrendous state, those ten brothers couldn't c confess and, and say, Dad, no, forget it. Oh, man, look at how this is, this is killing pops. No. The wickedness of their sin to allow their father to live all of these years in that state of having lost their son. And so now he's affected by that. Joseph and Benjamin were sons through Rachel, his favored wife. And so in that, he's like, no, I've already lost Joseph. Has he lost Joseph in the way that he thinks he has? No. And so in that sense, unfortunately, he's believing a lie. Now, no way he could, right? That was the story he got. That's what his sons told him. He saw the proof, if you will. But in his mind, it's a lie. The reality, he believes it, and it affects how he lives. And he's not going to let Benjamin go down to Egypt. He's going to hold him back to protect him, if you will. Moving on, verse 6 says, Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And so this second in command in Egypt, second to Pharaoh only, is the one that oversees this distribution process. The wisdom, the dream, and then the wisdom was that you're going to have seven years of plenty. In that seven years of plenty, double tax the people, and we will store grain for the seven years of famine. And so now we're in that seventh year. Joseph has been raised up to be in charge of that entire distribution. He was given the signet ring of the king, meaning his word is bond. Whatever he says is going to be done in the land. And in that, his brothers come to him and they just see a Lord. They just see the person in charge. And they bow down in respect, knowing that that's where we're going to get bread. Without this man, we die. Without this man... We cannot eat and move on in life. And so they bow down in what? In fulfillment to the very dream that God had given Joseph. And so man may try as well as he can to stop and halt the plan of God, but his arms are too short. There's a, a rap song by a cross movement. It says, when we try to fight God, we're like midgets on our knees. We can't. We can't reach up. Can't do it. Uh, let's see. What verse was that? Seven. So Joseph's brothers saw his brothers. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, "Where do you come from?" And they said to him, "From the land of Canaan to buy food." The idea of speaking roughly to them, God is going to use Joseph to draw repentance from his brothers. But to find that repentance, we need to know the state of his brothers. And so sometimes the truth is rough to people. We've been so codified in our culture. We've been told for so long that we're wonderful. We've been told so long that the moon, the stars, and the, and the sun, they rise and fall on us, which is a lie. That when the truth hits us and we recognize that we're not good enough to make it to heaven on our own, it's, it's an assault. It, it just it confronts the pride and, and many people are like, well, I don't want any part of that. I want to contribute. I want to get credit. Well, that's not how God works. And so he speaks roughly to them. They tell him that they're from Canaan to buy food. Verse 8. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. This could be his outfit. This could be the fact that his head is shaved. He's in Egypt, and he's um, taken on, if you will, the traditions of, of that. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had, verse 9, which he dreamed about, and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. So now Joseph takes this approach where he's going to, again, try to discover where their hearts are. Verse 10, And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. Now they're saying that they are honest men. And they are for the most part. But that's how we judge. 
humanity judges based on a curve. <laughs> or we're honest in most things. Were they honest men when they lied to their father? Were they honest men when they perpetuated the lie and they let it continue for two decades? Were they honest men when they're even coming to him and they're going to tell him a big fat lie about Joseph? About himself. Verse 12. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man, true, true, in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, true, and one is no more. One is no more. Is he dead? What happened to that one? They don't fess up. We, we sold one into slavery. We hated his guts. We threw him in a ditch. Then we saw these Ishmaelite traders <laughs> going to Egypt. And we gave him up. 20 pieces of silver. Verse 14. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. Wow, what a test, right? Oh yeah? You're telling the truth? All right. We'll put the truth to the test. Have your younger brother come. You're going to go get him. Verse 16. Send one of you and let him bring your brothers and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. And so that three days is an opportunity for them to think about, to be able now to contemplate that their behavior has brought consequences. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, know this, your sin will find you out. And again, man, you hear messages in church and you hear like God is just this, this God that's waiting in heaven with lightning bolts and ready to just shoot down these lightning bolts because he's so mad at you and that you're just, you're just anything but what he wants you to be. How about God's heart is for you and not against you? And how about God's best bet at trying to get you to come to him and realize that you need him is to expose the reality of your heart? That's what God's trying to do. He's not trying to get you. He's trying to win you. He made a way so that you can spend eternity with Him forever and ever. And you are the biggest obstacle in that. You are your worst enemy. You think it's the devil and you think it's the world and its system. But truth be known, you and I are our worst enemies. Because nobody talks to us more than we talk to ourselves. And we will convince ourselves out of God's will... And we will convince ourselves straight into the plot and the plan of the enemy and the world. It's crazy how it works. Or through humility, we can just come to God and say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I can't do this in my own. I don't have the strength to do this. God gives us that option. But he has to reveal those things to us. He has to reveal our hearts to us. And we swear that we're an exception to the rule. Let that sink in. We swear that we're an exception to the rule. We swear that this is what the Bible says and this is what's good for whatever, those people, however you define those people, but you don't understand my situation. You don't understand where I'm coming from and what I've been through. I might not, but he certainly does. And so ultimately we're called to walk by faith, taking him at his word trusting that he has an incredible plan for us. And so God is doing that through Joseph. He's trying to reveal these guys' hearts. And so they have three days to sit with this. Verse 14. Where? 18. Where were you guys? 18. Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. So before he was bringing Pharaoh into the equation, by the power of Pharaoh, by, by, by the authority that I have from Pharaoh, his three days, Joseph's three days were as well a time of contemplation. You know what? I fear God. And so let's move in the direction of God. If you are honest men, verse 19 says, let one of your brothers, so before it was a little different plan, so now let one of your brothers be confined to your prison, house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. 
So before it was, okay, all of you are going to be confined. One of you is going to go to the house and bring Benjamin back. No, 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 you want it? Let's confine one. Let's keep one in prison. And they did so. Verse 21. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when, we, when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. So now they're speaking in Hebrew. Within earshot of Joseph. Joseph has spoken to them through an interpreter, and he's been speaking Egyptian. The interpreter then was speaking Hebrew to them. And so now they're having an argument. And I believe, through just reading, I believe that it's Reuben is like, I told y'all, I told you let's not do this. And I think he's looking at Simeon. And he's like, man, you're the one, man, look at this mess we're in now. About to die, we gotta go get Benjamin. You know dad's not gonna let Benjamin leave. <laughs> we're doomed. Notice as we go on. And they did so, they said to one another, we are truly guilty, verse 21, of our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear, therefore the distress has come upon us, and Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter, and he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And so Reuben is the one speaking up to them. Simeon is the one that Joseph is going to put away to think about what he did. Why Simeon? Doesn't tell us, but again, I don't know. Just makes sense to me, the way I communicated that. So in that, think about what Joseph is feeling. Joseph has moved on, if you will, with his life. He's been pulled out of everything he knew. He was from under the roof of his father being the favored. Imagine how he grew up. Imagine just the gentleness and the tenderness of what he grew up with. And now he's been in Egypt, serving faithfully, honoring God with his life. And then he sees his brothers. And he sees this stuff transpiring. And for the first time now he's hearing Reuben saying, told you guys we shouldn't do this. Then he grabs Simeon and says, all right, Simeon, you're the one that's going to sit and be confined. You guys go ahead and go. Moving on, verse 25. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Why? Why would he give them their money back? Because if he's representing the bread of life, it's free. You can't buy it. You can't buy it with your effort. You can't buy it with your good works. You can't buy it with your money. It's a free gift. Salvation is extended to humanity. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That word believe is very significant. Trust and adhere to, cling to, rely upon. I might not believe anything else in the world but my life will demonstrate that I believe this. It will be evidence through everything I do through what I allow my brain to think about my actions everything will be filtered through my belief my trust in my adherence to my reliance upon and how I cling to this that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and out of gratitude I am so thankful to God so grateful that from here on everything will be filtered through this belief or mental ascent, yeah, no, I believe it, I believe it, and your life is no different than it ever was. It's not true belief. The demons believe, it says, and shudder, tremble. Does their belief get them into heaven? No, they're judged. They will spend eternity in hell, ultimately. And so the belief that God calls us to is more than a mental ascent. It's more than a simple acknowledgement. I believed my entire life that Jesus died on the cross. I just believed it. I would go to Catholic churches and Christian churches and I would have this understanding, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. Yeah, of course, me and Jesus, we're tight. We're like this. Mm -hmm. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. It was all a mental ascent until I gave my life to the Lord, until I surrendered my heart to God, until I prayed to receive and I believed from here. And it has affected the entirety of my life, how I interact with people, how I work, why I don't sleep in, why I wake up early and do everything, everything that I do is now filtered through that belief. Verse 25, then Joseph gave a command to fill their sack. So it's free. Verse 26, so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money and there it was the mouth of his, in the mouth of his sack so he said to his brothers, my money has been restored and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them and they were afraid, again emotions, saying to one another, what is that, this that God has done to us? Their emotions are causing them now in fear and their hearts failing them to begin to say, what is God doing? These are providential circumstances in our lives. These are not coincidental things. These are real things where, well, we have to acknowledge God is getting our attention. And they're going to begin to look to God. Verse 29. Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. And so they just recount the story of what exactly what took place to their father Jacob. Verse 35, Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Again, an emotion of fear. Whoa, what is going on? We, we gave this money for the food. Why is it in our sacks? Again, God getting their attention. And Jacob, verse 36, their father said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All things are against me. I mentioned this last week. In absolute contradiction to the uh, Bible, Romans 8, 28, instead of knowing that all things are for me, all things are against me. Um, John Corson does a... Um, he does a devotion on this scripture. And he takes Romans 8.28. And he says, knowing Jacob and his character, if he truly believed that all things were against him, he wouldn't do what he's about to do in the next chapter. In the next chapter, he's going to let Benjamin go. In this chapter, he's not. He's going to hold him back. But circumstances are going to get to the point where they run out of food. And they have nothing. And now you're looking at year two or year three, wherever it is in the famine. And you're, it, the choice is either let Benjamin go or we die. We're either going to die here with Benjamin under my roof staring at him or we're going to let him go to see if we can get grain from Egypt. And so John Corson basically says that we intuitively, because the Bible declares, we intuitively as Christians know that all things are working together for good. But because we love man to look at us and draw attention away from God to us, we act as though that were not true. And so it's, it's an incredible devotion, once again. It's in his study Bible. But that we would be careful to live out the truth that all things are working together for good in our lives. Verse 29. Oh, no, no, I'm way down there. I just looked at the top of the page. All things are against me. 27. Where? 37. You too can be a teacher. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, this is Reuben's solution to his father saying, all things are against me. 
Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. So again, Reuben's stepping up. I'll, I'll give you the thing that I love the most, Dad. I'll give you my two boys. And, and, and you kill them if I don't come back with Benjamin. I mean, with, yeah, with Benjamin. It's pretty honorable. But he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, not true, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. And so just an interesting, again, picture Jacob's emotional state. It's all based on lies. He's believing that Joseph has been killed. He's believing that he hasn't seen him. He's believing that his brother is growing up, growing up Benjamin, without a full brother. He's got his other ten brothers. What good are they? <laughs> if, you, if you want an enemy, look at those ten, if you will. But let's go to the title of the message. What if? What if by God's sovereignty, and what if by God's providence, God was doing the work behind the scenes? And it was bigger than Jacob, and it was bigger than Joseph, and it was bigger than Benjamin, and it was bigger than Reuben, and it was bigger than Simeon, and Levi, and Gat, and all these brothers. What if God was doing something behind the scenes to ultimately bring forth, through this nation, who these 12 sons would represent as the nation of Israel? What if? God wanted to bring a savior to the world. And knowing what was on the horizon, that a famine was going to come. And what if, all of those decades earlier, God decided to give a little 17-year-old boy a dream, knowing the pain that this little boy would experience in his life. But yet this greater good, this bigger picture, the Messiah coming through this lineage would be able to come to, to the world to save the world. Well, we know that's true through history. But now you have to implant yourself into the story. What if God is sovereign over your life? What if God is providential over your life? What if God knew every quirk, weakness, idiosyncrasy, debilitating condition that you would have an experience in life and yet through that God was doing a greater work God was doing something bigger than you even if it's through you what if and we can evaluate that and we can think about that I believe that when we get to heaven having a full understanding of God and truth I think I'm going to blush. I really do think I'm going to be ashamed to not fully live my life out in faith, knowing that God would not be indicted, knowing that God knows what He's doing, knowing that God's not going to ruin His reputation on me. And we have to really think about these things. These are theological things but this is the reality of where we live because when we suffer, when we go through difficulty, when bad things happen in life and we are living through it, we swear that God's taking a nap. We sit there and think, well, I must be an exception because God, who's a God of love and a God that's all powerful, wouldn't allow this thing to happen. And we begin to do this mental gymnastics based on our circumstances as opposed to doing the very thing that God wants us to do, to look to Him to find what we need. And so that's where I got the idea of the what if. The other little subtitle that I gave it was Some of the Lies We Believe. If we look at Jacob and some of the lies he believed, it tainted or clouded his judgment. And you and I have to go into this knowing that we have strongholds and there, there are things that we believe that are not true. They're just not true. And I don't care the source. I don't care where you or I have heard them from. They're just not true. And we have to know that going in. Let God be true. 
and every man a liar, the Bible declares. And we need to be very, very careful when we begin to question God, question the goodness of God, question the fact that God loves me. When we begin to question those things, there's something that's blocking, there's something that we don't understand, there's something that we don't presently have. And we'll do everything to hold on in control of what we think we can hold on in control. And the reality is there's not very much that we're in control of. We are in control of what we think about. We are in control of the source of truth that we go to. So we need to be very, very careful. Pastor Chuck Smith does a, an entire message on guilt on this section of Scripture and being guilty and walking in that guilt when all the while Jesus carried that guilt on the cross for us. And people will heap guilt upon us and the world will point to us and just all of religion will do it. And yet Jesus carried it for us. And the condemning nature of guilt is something to behold. And yet Jesus carried it for us to liberate us, to free us up, and we walk in that. Interesting dynamic. The last little subsection was emotions. Can we trust them or can you trust them? By the way, Dr. James Dobson wrote a book called Emotions, Can You Trust Them? Spoiler alert, nope. <laughs> you can't trust them. Anybody know how many emotions there are? 460. What? That's a lot of emotions. I can't trust all 460 of them. Sometimes. Sometimes. So you have your predominant joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation. Those are your main eight. And from there, they kind of branch out and branch off. For example, in anger, you have the extreme emotional state of anger, which is what? Rage. And in the less severe emotional state, you have annoyance. You're annoying. Just annoyed. It's, it's the form of anger. Anger is the root of that, but it can go as far as rage, and it can be as light as annoyance. Uh, what's another one that we struggle with? Sadness. You have grief on a deep level and pensiveness, which is ah, a little perturbed there, right? In sadness, but it can lead to grief. God doesn't want us to deny any of these emotions. God doesn't want us to be robotic. But I was thinking about um, like a sociopath who doesn't feel, who does not have the ability to um, regulate or even consider their emotions. They're, they're basically emotionless, right? A sociopath. They can kill without remorse. They can do horrendous acts. I was thinking of a narcissist, totally self-centered, totally just all about the person with no regard to how they make or their behavior makes other people feel. And so there are those extreme cases of what's taking place. But for the most part, God wants us to experience this set of emotions. They're housed within our soul. And the soul is going to be the determining factor of whether we are going to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. And so when it comes to the emotions, can we trust them? They have to be filtered through something bigger than what we feel. And the reason is, is because as you look at this chapter, Jacob was anybody who would be able to look at Jacob's life and they would begin to evaluate Jacob and what he was feeling. No, I'm not going to let my little son go because you've already bereaved me of my other son. Not true. But he felt it intently that it was true, didn't he? And now Simeon is held in prison in Egypt. He's no more. Not true. They're going to be re reunited as a family. Jacob's going to see his son again. And he's going to see his son Joseph again. And so what he was feeling, and through that his behavior was contradictory to God. All things weren't working against you, Jacob. God had not failed you. God had not left you. You believed lies and it affected how you felt. And then your actions were based on 
how you felt as opposed to, I'm going to walk by faith. I don't feel like doing this. It doesn't feel right. In fact, everything is communicating one thing that it's coming through all my senses. But guess what? The Bible clearly says that I am to trust God. So I'm going to trust God. And that was his choice. And so I do believe that God wants us to feel. And I don't want to, I, I don't believe that he wants us to pretend because that's called denial. And when we grieve, for example, when we're sad and we grieve, and that's an extreme level of that emotion, then God wants to comfort us in that grief. And guess what? We might not feel like doing certain things as we are experiencing grief. Grief is a powerful emotion, but it's part of what God has given us to work through the pain and the suffering in our life. And it's okay. And we don't just grieve the loss of people. We definitely grieve the loss of people, but we grieve losses in our life. We have this idealistic idea of life from 18 on. At 17, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Oh, man, I got it all laid out. You should, you know, listen to my nephew. A little, little, you know, 16, 15 year old. Okay, I'm going to, basically he's going to be a billionaire and he's going to buy the best cars and he's going to live in the greatest houses and he's going to have best looking chicks and just all this stuff. And you listen to him, you're like, shut up. I don't even know what you're talking about, right? Very idealistic in our youth as we continue to grow. And then all of a sudden we start realizing, huh, Maybe I'm not going to do that or be that or whatever. And that's okay. But we have to grieve those losses. We have to actually hurt, mourn those things. Say, man, this was the direction I thought I was going to go in. But it didn't happen. It's okay. Let God lead you. Let God guide you. You can plan your life out as though you're going to live to 100. But hold those plans up, open hands to God and say, Lord, whatever you see fit to change or adjust. To God be the glory. you got a way better plan for me than i got for myself. This is the direction I want to move towards. And so with grieving and that extreme emotional state that we find ourselves in, feel it. But don't base the decisions that you make on grief. Feel that. Press into God. When my heart is overwhelmed, Psalm 61 says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lord, I need you. I need you in this moment. Wow, that's some debilitating news. That's going to be a hard season. And as you truly go through grief, you're going to go through all kinds, a cycle of emotions. And if you cheat that, it's going to leak out later in life. Guarantee it. You're going to have a chip on your shoulder. People are going to touch that button. And all of a sudden, you're going to fly off the handle. And people are going to look at you like, what the... I just said this, and they just, whoo, this extreme reaction. You didn't deal with it. And that could be any one of these. Your emotions are like a light uh, on the dashboard, and they're to alert you to something that's going on inside your soul. And God wants you to work that soul stuff out. And so be careful. Don't deny your emotions. Don't pretend that you're not feeling what you feel. Sit with it. Be still and know that I am God. Sit before God. Lord, help me process this. I have lived many, many states in disequilibrium. Throughout my life, I have lived where I'm doing this and it just doesn't match my emotions. I just feel like something's not right. And what I do in those states, in those times, is I take a step back and I begin to evaluate my priorities. And I say, what are my priorities? And I'll, I'll write them down on a yellow tablet. I'll write them down. Priorities, priorities, priorities. Then I'll look at my actions and inevitably they don't match. I'm doing what I'm not convicted to do. My priorities are out of line. And I realize usually I'm doing too much and I have to chop at the bottom. These are not my priorities. And that's why I feel off. So I bring those priorities back in line. I bring my behavior back in line with my priorities. And what I find is that other stuff's going to have to be done by somebody else. 
Somebody else is going to have to do all that other stuff that are not my priorities based on God's love letter, His truth. Okay? So don't deny your emotions. Don't pretend that you don't feel what you feel. And nothing wrong with taking a step back and just saying, Lord, I need to sit with you. I need to get with you. I think I answered them all. What if some of the lies we believe? Emotions, can you trust them? Don't trust your emotions in the sense that you're going to live your life and make decisions based on how you feel. Do it based on something that's objective, not subjective. The Word of God is objective. It's true. It's true whether you or I believe it. The bumper sticker that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You can remove that second line. God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not. Again, let God be true and every man a liar. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, you want us to feel. You don't want us to be unfeeling. You want us to walk in these truths. You want us to love. You want us to be loved. You want us to experience the wonder of all of these wonderful things. And so, Lord, we thank you. In recognition of the pain that Joseph was in, in recognition of the pain that Jacob was in, one was based on truth, one was based on lies that he had believed for whatever reason. And so, Lord, thank you for these examples that you give us in Scripture. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. And Lord, help us to navigate through these things. Continue to be honored in our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me...